Howdy, and welcome to a tea party like no other. It is Show and Tell Saturdays here on Tea Time with Afternoon Social. Presenting Steph West, social coach, Starfish Social Club founder, and podcast host. Grab your favorite teacup. Good afternoon, and welcome to Show and Tell Saturdays. I'm Teresa Lauterbach, your host, and we're back again with Steph and West. And she has uh, been with us this whole weekend. On, so you have to go back and check out the other videos on Triumphant Thursday about all of her Ironman competition. And Friends Day Friday, she had a, great, a lot of great advice to share about her business and <clears throat> how to excel in life. And now today, we're going to hear more about her podcast and uh, some details about her, her business, the Starfish Social Club. So hi, Steph. How are you today? Hello, I'm glad to be back. So, yeah, Starfish Social Club, um, it's it's sometimes hard for me to describe it succinctly because it is different. Uh, Basically, I teach social skills groups. Um, We talked on Thursday about neurodivergent and what that means. Most of my students are autistic or have ADHD. That is probably 90% of the students that I work with, but it is not a a criteria factor. Uh, Basically, my program is open to anybody who is at least seven years old and Mm -hmm. struggles with peer relationships. Um, So those are the students who are in my program. And we focus on teaching the kids the things that I have learned that they just don't know or that they just don't understand. So we do not focus on traditional social skills like greeting somebody, accepting a gift, um, you know, like just all the tradition, holding the door for the person behind you. We don't focus on, on these boxed, scripted things. I teach my kids how to be more socially aware of what's going on around them and more self-aware in terms of how what they are saying or doing is affecting them. Uh, Because one of the things that a lot of people who think differently don't always recognize is that the things that we say and do cause other people to have thoughts about us, which Mm -hmm. creates our reputation, right? right? And our reputation leads to the way that people treat us. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our kids don't understand that that whole concept. And so they do not understand why other people don't like them, don't want to talk to them, um, avoid them, ignore them, that kind of thing. And so that's what I help kids with is is recognizing that cycle so they can recognize other choices that they can make instead. And um, it helps them become more socially competent. They're more aware of how the social world works. And um, they also meet other students here in my program. So there's a lot of connections that are made because we're all neurodivergent around here. Yeah. Um, so it's it's also a really great community. So on my podcast, what I, I I've kind of gone all over the place with it because as you can tell, I'm I'm kind of all over the place. <laughs> and I like to talk. So when I first started it a little over a year ago, it was called Social Skills is Canceled. Uh, And that was my reference to the fact that I don't actually teach social skills. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That's just the term that everybody uses and is familiar with. And so when I started it, I was doing topical episodes. So each episode would have something specific that I was talking about. And I just kind of got tired of that, honestly. I kind of got tired of having to think about things ahead of time. I'm a very in the moment person. Um, And so I switched it up and I changed the title of it. It's now called Social Skills Unscripted. And primarily what I do now is it's me and my coworker who teaches the groups with me. And we talk about the things that happen when the kids are here. We, we talk about specific students, um, not by name, of course, but we share, you know, scenarios of specific kids. We talk about the things that they're struggling with. We talk about the um, the interventions that we do, the things that we say, the the strategies that we that we use 
so that parents and teachers who listen to it can, number one, identify their own kid in our kids, right? Because our program has about 50 kids in it. Right. Um, and we've been open for seven years. <laughs> so <laughs> there, I mean, we've got all kinds of kids to talk about. And so parents and teachers can listen and identify other kids who remind them of their own kid. And then they can listen to how we support those kids and the things that we say and the things that we do to help our students grow socially. Um, so that's the point of the podcast right now. I'm, I'm toying with the idea of starting to have guests on it. Um, <laughs> I think my hesitation with that is that I am not a planner. I'm a very like, oh, I'm going to record an episode now. Uh, just whenever I feel like it. And so the thought of having to organize uh, and plan ahead of time, uh, I'm not sure yet (laughs) if I want to take that on. Um, I like just being able to do things when I feel like doing them. But that's, that's my business and that's my podcast. And I also teach other people how to start a program just like mine. Um, It's primarily parents who have neurodivergent kids and have looked around in their community and realize there's not really anything um, like my program that's there to help them and support them. And so, as we've been talking about, when you have an idea, it's because it's meant for you. Um, So I I know that when people come across my program and they think, oh, my kid needs that, sometimes that means that you need to start it for your kid. (laughs) (laughs) Or like me, if you're coming from education and you just think, you know, I talked to somebody the other day who actually just graduated from college, but is thinking that she doesn't know that she wants to teach in a school system. She doesn't know that she wants, you know, that rigidity. And and so that's another great candidate for someone to start a program like mine, wherever she lives. Right. Um, So, yeah, that's that's my my business that's what i do and that's my my show <laughs> okay uh well uh and we're gonna put all of our information in the links and everything so you can contact her on the, through your website and her email address but uh <clears throat> so you don't offer a lot of one-on-one services yours is mostly group in the starfish social club you know what that's a great question In the past, so again, I've had my business for seven years. In the past, I have never done one-on-one because the whole point of my program is the group. That's the whole point of it. Um, Mm -hmm. Most neurodivergent kiddos get along really well with adults. And so it's not really that beneficial from a social perspective to have an adult and a child working one-on-one on social skills because that's usually not where the issue is. The issue is a child in a group of other kids. Mm-hmm. So I will say for the seven years, I, I did not do one-on-one because I feel like it's counterintuitive to my program. However, I recently was contacted by a, a parent who lives on the other side of the country. Um, her son is in college and very self-aware and is able to recognize what he's having a hard time with. He just doesn't know what to do differently. So he actually emailed me a list of the things that he struggles with. He just doesn't know how to not struggle with them. And I recognized, um, number one, he doesn't live in my city. Um, Number two, I think um, he's probably more advanced than my program is. And so the group might not be as beneficial to him as it is to all the other kids. Um, And so we're about to start working together one-on-one. And that just made me be more open and receptive to that idea. I'm also now working one-on-one with a teen kiddo who's in my group program, but his mom wants him to have additional support um, so that we meet one-on-one before the group program. And then we work on his specific needs in the context of the group program. Um, I also was contacted by an adult who is um, runs her own business and said her social anxiety is so extreme that she won't do, you know, coaching calls and Facebook lives and and the things that she needs to be able to do to run a coaching business, right? Right. So um, I actually do now offer one-on-one support um, 
for people who, uh, for maybe the, the schedule of my group programs doesn't work for them, uh, maybe they just want more individual support, maybe they're you know adults, and so my program is for kids and teens. So that has been my shift, I will say, is I used to not be willing to do one-on-one, -on -one, but now I recognize that my program is not for everybody, but I can help anybody and everybody with social. I, I really can, regardless of the age, regardless of, you know, whether it's anxiety or autism or whatever it is, I can help. It's just, it's what I understand. So that's a really long answer to your question. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, okay. But I also, I really love it when there's times where I change my mind about things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really love when I can be open um, to doing something different than what I think it should be. So that was, that was my recent example of that. That's good. And so in your current endeavors, as you're, you're expanding that one-on-one -on -one and we'll talk about that podcast, are you, are you thinking about some of the, what are some of the topics that are you thinking about covering on the podcast coming up? So this summer I'm focusing on executive functioning, uh, which is kind of a broad term that people have usually heard but might not really understand. Executive functioning is basically everything that our frontal lobe is responsible for. Um, it's planning, organizing, um, thinking ahead of time, time management, uh, resource management, being able to start things, being able to finish things. So if you if you have kids and you say, you know, you ask your kiddo to clean their room, if they have executive functioning challenges, that will never happen. No. Um, homework, right? Doing homework, um, being anywhere on time, uh, you know, uh, having what they need to get something done. Just everything related to planning and organization. It's also things like emotional regulation and attentional regulation. Mm -hmm. um, basically, if you think about ADHD, it's all the things that you think about under ADHD, but pretty much anybody with a neurodiversity has some level of executive functioning challenges. Uh, so that's what my podcast is about this summer. I created activities that we do. I also run a summer camp as part of my program. Mm -hmm. So I created activities that we do here with our students to, to build their executive functioning skills, but they're fun. There's writing activities and drawing activities and building activities and, and games. So every week this summer, I'm sharing 10 activities under a different modality. And then I actually do have my first guest coming on. Um, he is an executive functioning coach. So what we do is actually pretty similar. Um, just I focus on social and he focuses more on homework and, and assignments and daily living and that kind of thing. So he will be my first guest. We're recording our episode in a couple days. Um, and then after summer, I don't know what I'm doing next. One thought I had was to focus on a specific student for each episode, obviously not by name, but just saying these are the things that this kiddo struggles with and these are the interventions and strategies that we're doing um, so that anybody who's listening who relates to that kiddo now has ideas of things that they can do with their own kid or student. I've also thought about doing episodes based on certain challenges. Like we could do one all about social anxiety. We could do one all about scripting, which is when kids mimic things that they've seen or heard. Uh, we can do one all about kids who um, try way too hard to make friends and then everybody just thinks they're annoying. So after summer, I actually, I don't know <laughs> what direction <laughs> we're going in. Um, yeah. I will probably pull my audience because I, I can talk about anything. I just want to make sure that what I'm talking about is helpful and relevant and meaningful to the people who are listening to me talk about it. So, yeah. <laughs> that, well, it sounds like it'll be a really interesting podcast to, episodes to listen to. And especially for those who, like I said, are struggling. And, and I had men mentioned before off in our emails that I had to raise a child with no resources yeah. and that's in that field. So. 
having all that information will be very beneficial to uh, a lot of our listeners out there that are looking for help with their their kiddos that they're trying to, to uh, with those with kids in that umbrella mm-hmm. they I know they they're 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 more individual than nor you could take a whole bunch of quote normal kids in a classroom be able to teach them all one way and get by with it but with yeah with these kiddos they have it has to be streamlined for every one of them so yeah. getting with ideas because sometimes one thing will click for one kid but not for the other yeah and and so educating also parenting right, right. i mean even anybody who has more than one kid if one of them is neurodivergent you're very aware of that and even you know we've got lots of families who have multiple kids who are neurodivergent and every one of them you have to parent differently right right? so yeah i you know i hear that and i you know grew up as a neurodivergent kiddo didn't know it at the time life for me and my brother was very different from each other and my parents are very traditional and they parent my brother's older. They parented him very traditionally, and then here I pop out of the womb. <laughs> and you know, it's like none of that. None. And I know my parents really had a hard time with me growing up. Um, so yeah, it's definitely if you have more than one kiddo and at least one of them is neurodivergent, you you see that tradition does not work. And like you said, the same in school, right? Tradition does not work. Right. Yeah. But there there are, um, for certain differences, there are strategies that I use with every kid who's struggling with that, with that skill set or with that difference or whatever. There are certain strategies that, that will work with this situation. Right. Um, And so, you know, that's part of what I want to share is even though 15 kids with this behavior or this situation or this challenge are all different from each other, the same strategies can work for all 15 of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's, you know, here we have um, up to 15 kids at a time in our program because it's a group program. So I, yeah, I mean, if I, if I can handle 15 neurodivergent kids, (laughs) you know, running around here. Right. um, yeah. And one more thing I'll, I'll share too, uh, is that I have learned, I realized that there's three different kind of personality types when it comes to neurodivergent kids and there's overlap, right? It's kind of like a personality test. There's overlap, right. but it's also really helpful to know which one of these is your kiddo because different strategies don't work for the same kids. Um, and there's a free quiz on my website that you can take and, and do this for your kiddo or your students. But mm-hmm. there's kids that I call circle kids. And these are kids that are really easygoing. People get along with them. People like them. People like to be around them. But they don't actually have friends. Like other kids like them, but they're right. never invited places. They they don't have anybody's phone number. You know, they don't know how to have conversations with other kids. So those are circle kids. Those a lot of people are really confused, but I don't get why my kid doesn't have friends. Everybody likes her, mm-hmm. you know, but they don't know how to engage. They they don't know how to have those social interactions. Um, a triangle kid, uh, which was me and sounds like might have been your kiddo as well, <laughs> are the kiddos that um, are difficult. <laughs> yeah. They're the kiddos that tend to have a reputation for being rude or annoying Mm -hmm. or a lot, right? Your kids a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And triangle kids are very social usually, but they get rejected over and over and over. Um, They often get bullied because they tend to be kind of extreme. They tend to be a lot. And so triangle kids are overcompensating, right? Mm -hmm. But they, they usually recognize that the other kids don't like them. Um, And then square kids are our kids that have social anxiety. And this can look a little bit different. Um, Most kids that have social anxiety will retreat. Um, They they don't want to join the group. They don't want people to ask them questions. They want to sit in the corner and be invisible. Um, So that's most kids that have social anxiety. But there's also some kids that have social anxiety that look like a triangle kid 
Right. But really, it's because they're overcompensating and being really loud and really out there because they're so anxious. Right. Um, so those are the three types of kids. And what's interesting is in my program, I have almost an exact balance between the three. Oh. Um, yeah. So there's not any one that, that comes through more often than any other. It's almost yeah. an exact balance between the three. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your business and endeavors that you have going on this week. And uh, I'm glad you were able to join us here on Tea Time with Afternoon Social. And like I said, I'm going to put all of her contact information in the bottom so you can contact Steph uh, to find out more about her program and go out there and listen to her podcast. Uh, as I, I'm hosting pod, podcast host this month. So <laughs> it's good to hear about all the different kind of podcasts that are out there and all the information that you can receive. So thank you again, Stephanie, for uh, joining us t- this week and we will stay in contact. Thanks, Teresa.